I have the privilege tonight to be talking to a composer who needs no introduction, Mr. John Cage. And that fragment of the piece you just heard was part of the beginning of Fontana Mix with Aria, which rest of which we'll hear later. I thought I'd be very unfair and put you, well, sort of on the spot now, Mr. Cage, at, right at the opening, by quoting two recent comments on your music. The first comes from, of all persons, writer Norman Mailer, who in his article of on the Sonny Liston, Floyd Patterson fight of all places, had this to say, and I quote him. I had a moment of vast hatred then for that bleak gluttonous void of the establishment, that liberal power at the center of our lives, which gave jargon with charity, substituted the intolerance of mental health for the intolerance of passion, alienated emotion from its roots and man from his past, cut the giant of our half-wakened arts to fit a bed of Procrustes, Leonard Bernstein on the podium, John Cage in silence, offered a national art center which would be to art as canned butter is to butter, and existed in a terror of eternity which built a new religion of the psyche on a god who died, old Dr. Freud, of cancer. Well, that was Norman Mailer. The next is from an article by teacher and critic Michael Steinberg, entitled Tradition and Responsibility, and this article appears in the New Perspectives of New Music. And I quote him, The rise of music that is totally without social commitment also increases the separation between composer and public, and represents still another form of departure from tradition. The cynicism with which this particular departure seems to have been made is perfectly symbolized in John Cage's account of a public lecture he had given and Steinberg quotes you. Later, during the question period, I gave one of six previously prepared answers regardless of the question asked. This was a reflection of my engagement in Zen. <coughs> and Steinberg continues. While Mr. Cage's famous silent piano piece or his landscapes for a dozen radio receivers may be of little interest as music, they are of enormous importance historically as representing the complete abdication of the artist's power. I wondered, Mr. Cage, what is this all about? It seems to me that we are all moving in many directions at the present time, and that each one who is conscientious in his work and in his life must answer for himself the question why he does what he does. In the middle 40s, I became involved in answering the question, why do I write music? In college, and through most of my experience in society, I had the notion that an artist did what he did because he had something to say to other people. But I noticed that composers were most of them all writing in different ways, that frequently I misunderstood what another composer was saying simply because I had little understanding of his language. And I found other people misunderstanding what I myself was saying when I was saying something pointed and direct. For instance, during World War II, being still interested in my conception of beauty and wanting in my work to concentrate my attention and therefore my listeners' attention 
attentions on the beautiful, it struck me that beauty had gone out of all things large and big in society and was confined to relations between those in love and those in friendship. And yet, when seeing uh, love disappear, I wrote a piece called The Perilous Night, speaking in it of things that one might associate with anguish. I found people hearing this music in terms of a woodpecker in a uh, church belfry. It struck me that, that even though I was doing my best to speak in my music, that I was not being understood. And so I began to question whether or not I should continue writing music in a society where people going in many different directions, speaking different languages, we were, I thought, in a Tower of Babel situation. At this very time, an Indian musician came from India. Her name was Gita Sarabhai. She was concerned over the influence that Western music was having on the traditions of Indian music. And she studied with a number of people in a concentrated fashion for six months. She studied counterpoint in a survey of contemporary music with me. She studied, I believe, uh, harmony with Arthur Berger. She studied musicology, I think, with uh, Kurt Sox. I asked her what her teacher had said was the purpose of music. At the same time, another composer with whom I was closely associated at the time, Lou Harrison, was also concerned to discover why we were writing music. The Indian musician told me that her teacher had said the purpose of music is to sober and quiet the mind, thus making it susceptible to divine influences. Lou Harrison found an English composer, I forget in which century, but as late as the 17th, saying the purpose of music is to sober and quiet the mind, thus making it susceptible to divine influences. I deduced that if this answer came from two such separate points in space and time, that it was true, at least it was going to be true for me. So I set out to find the answer to two questions. What is a sober mind and what are divine influences? Now this takes us far away, I grant, from the criticisms that you have read about my work. But I I give them and don't give answers to those others simply in order to let you know what I'm doing. I understand. You, you, in other words, the problem as to whether or not your music becomes part of some sort of liberal power at the center of our lives, uh, as Mailer puts it, sort of theatrically in a way, doesn't really, uh, is not an, uh, uh, really a relevant question. In, in well, actually, I don't understand what Mailer says. His language seems to me uh, so uh, ornamented that I don't perceive the thought in it. I perceive only uh, a kind of uh, encrusted uh, language. See, no, I, I don't know what he's saying. If you can translate it into clear, simple <laughs> English, do. Well, <laughs> <laughs> something that, well, it becomes John Cage, Leonard Bernstein, a lot of loaded words here. It's, um, intolerance of passion, mental health. Th these are the things that... But I don't understand, for instance, intolerance of passion. What does that mean? Well... Passion is intolerable, I suppose. I uh, think that's a... But I'm, I'm not dealing with passion. Yes. Nor am I dealing with intolerance. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, think he was use, I think he was using uh, John Cage in silence, as he puts it, as a, as a kind of a, a manifestation of a symptom, of the syndrome, almost. What syndrome? Uh, sort of the John Cage in silence, what he calls yes. John Cage in silence. He, he links it up with a type of the liberal establishment that he calls it, which is sort of ruining us, which is killing us, so to speak. Uh -huh. Well, I have the reverse hope that, <laughs> uh, though I am going to die, as all of us, I'm on the side of life. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, about um, Steinberg says you're, um, 
you're abdicating your responsibilities as a composer. Now, this I know is yes. an often level. But that's perhaps what set me off on that yes. long story. Yeah, I think that because I think the uh, respon my responsibility is not to have something to say, but rather, first of all, to sober and quiet my mind, uh, making me susceptible to divine influences, and second, through my music, to perhaps let that happen for other people. Okay, I, th I think that that takes care of that. Um, in, in your book s called Entitled Silence, a book which I hope all our listeners will try to get a hold of and read just for its really exhilarating stories and even poetry, I'd like to come back to that later, literary aspects, but in this book you make the point at one point that people are afraid to give up Bach, I think I'm paraphrasing it, but they're afraid to give up Bach, to give up order in music, in other words, because, as you put it, what would they have left? Yet I wonder, isn't this beside the point? After all, a work of art orders and embodies musical ex musical feelings, and the more meaningful and the more um, emotionally mov moving music of any particular time derives these mo these moving feelings seem to derive from just this ordering, except, of course, in, in the case of uh, a traditionally oriented um, improvisational type of musical experience, such as the Indian Raga. To be quite blunt, as you have allowed the pianist in your piano concerto to choose at random musical phrases and sounds, and thus forfeiting your control over the development of an imaginative musical idea, how can we qualitatively even begin to compare your concerto with, say, Schoenberg's magnific magnificent work in the same genre? Mm. I wonder if that's a fair question. Yes. Y you, you want to know whether you can compare these two things and... Um, qualitatively, yes. Well, those are two things I'm not particularly interested in. That is to say, I'm not particularly interested in quality, and I'm certainly not interested in comparisons between things. I think that we gain in awareness <coughs> by seeing each thing in its own terms. And I think that if we, if we think in terms of quality, that means that we are comparing the work which we experience with standards which uh, represent our prejudices. Now, if we can somehow empty our minds of those prejudices, then we possibly can approach our experience, whether it is in or outside art, for what it is, that is to say, directly. The reason it would be almost pointless to compare my work with that of Schoenberg is that we are working in, in the works are made in, in entirely different ways. As I see it, Scheinberg was still involved in the making of an object in time with, its, with relationships within that object so that there is a whole and that that whole has parts and they are subjected to organization. I'm not working with that problem. In those terms, I'm working with disorganization. I'm not making objects. I'm involved in showing processes. Well, would you say then, uh, in a way, you, you might be placing, um, transferring the, um, the understanding, let's say, to, of a piece, on the person, of course, but Aren't you also transferring the the um, what would seem to me to be an objective basis of quality onto the saying that it's my personal problem? Let's put it this way: that it might be my personal problem that I cannot understand or accept your piano concerto in the same way I accept Schoenberg's. Yet to me, it seems that uh, the Schoenberg piece is con moving every time I hear it in many in many levels in terms of its innocence, its gaiety, its deep mysticism, mm -hmm. its 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 uh, its almost sexual excitement in a way. Uh, I mean, you're, trans you're saying that it is my fault, almost, my lack of uh, understanding. No, no, not your fault. It's just that you could enrich your experience mm -hmm. by being able to see one thing as being an object with all these benefits that you have mentioned now coming to you from it. But if, if you use a different attitude toward my work or that of another composer, uh, it just might be that you would um, have 
find other things coming uh, to your experience through it. Yes, I see. Um, I, I see I do admire very much the Fontana mix with Aria, but I do not admire very much the piano concerto. Mm. Well, there are people who do, though. And uh, they speak, for instance, when they speak of enjoying it, they speak of their experiences in nature. Peter Yates is compared, listening to the piano concerto, with his experience of looking at the star in the night sky. Now, no one can deny the delight of having the emotions you spoke of a little bit ago. Also, no one can deny the pleasure of looking at the night sky. Yes, but, but the emotions of, uh, that a piece of music should give you at the, at the highest level really should have no relevance to any type of natural phenomenon, it seems to me. On the contrary. You say that it, a piece of music should give us emotions. That's yes. already something that can be uh, questioned. And particularly what emotion? Uh, let me list the emotions of traditional Indian aesthetic. They are four white, four black, and one in the center, which is... Um, uh, compulsory. The four white ones are humor, wonder, the erotic, and the heroic. And the heroic is seen not as conquering one's opponent, but rather as accepting one's experience. The four black ones are anger, fear, disgust, and sorrow. And the central compulsory one is tranquility. Tranquility is largely missing from the enjoyment of so-called classical European music because of its constantly moving toward uh, climaxes. But tranquility is not missing from the enjoyment of the night sky. It would sort of, you could compare it um analogically to a, a whirlpool with the calm spot in the center. Would that be a fair comparison? The, the whirlpool always has a calm spot in the center. That's very good. Okay. I was wondering, uh, in, in regard to this, uh, Stravinsky, I know you've, I think you've answered this just, just, just now, but, well, I'd like to ask you this anyway, quote at least Stravinsky's uh, comment in Poetics. He says, all music being nothing but a succession of impulses and repose, it is easy to see that the drawing together and separation of poles of attraction in a way, determine the respiration of music. Now, it's implied that you do not agree with that, that you agree this is so of, of traditional Western music, but you don't think this is necessarily inherent in any musical experience, even, in a, in, in a, even when not consciously attempted? No. For me, the basic musical experience is the absence of music. Let me uh, clarify that statement. I mean to say that wherever anyone is, if he simply listens to ambient sounds, disorganized as they are in his environment, not moving from repose to still, uh, from repose to what is it? Um, uh, activity. It's, it's, well, he says uh, succession of impulses and repose. Yes, not yeah. moving in a linear fashion from one sound to another, but coming from the total space around one wherever he is. This experience of sound that is available to everyone is for me the basic music which I simply interrupt when I put sounds into it. Okay, I understand that. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions concerning the idea of silence which have been very interesting to me. Uh, from the Avada Masaka doctrines, uh, we read that and I'll quote this. Because sounds are so fleeting, so transitory, as you just said, the presence of silence is felt all the more profoundly. A moment has communion with eternity when sound meets silence to create music. That's the end of the quote. And later it is stated in these doctrines that music begins in silence and ends in silence. But I'm wondering whether this doesn't fail to mention what seems to me the fact that musical silence and silence, that silence for instance, are two different and separate things. For instance, from the first note or sound of a musical composition, the musical silence is created within the framework of the composition, generated by that first sound, 
Would you agree with this distinction? Uh, certainly, if we are speaking about objects, you see. Then those silences work with the relationships between the sounds that are being set up by the particular ways of uh, organization that the composer is using. But if you begin, as I do, not with the notion of making objects, but with the idea of making a process, and if that process is in fact silent, which is to say the sounds are unwilled, then the silence takes on an entirely different significance. In other words, the, the music is evident constantly whether there are sounds or silences. Well, why? And it's not an arrangement any longer, and there's no problem about relationships. How does a composition of yours then begin? Uh, circumstantially. Uh, by that I mean this. If it's being presented on a musical program and is being preceded by another piece and followed by a third, then it begins after the second piece is finished and ends before the third <laughs> piece has begun. <laughs> I see, but you, you have to... <laughs> well, that takes care of that, but I wonder... <laughs> it can last, by the way, any length of time. And this, rather than being um, necessarily ridiculous, is practical. Because if the rest of the music on the program takes 50 minutes, and if the total length of the program is to be 70, then there are 20 minutes left for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I mean... <laughs> Let's put it this way, if we accept this standard, <laughs> or this, this, this way of judging um, a music on the radio, let's say, and circumstantially, then all of a sudden Bach, St. Matthew Passion, which precedes or comes after your piece, almost is uh, brought down, either, either brought down or raised to this uh, same criteria. In other words, uh, three hours of listening to, whatever that means, three hours of listening to St. Matthew Passion, and then listening to your work or your work heard before this, actually... Um, are the same experience in a sense, the same um, when when what is known is that Bach organized his 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 uh, the recitatives, his chorales, his arias in a certain psychological or, or formal way, traditional way. No, in that case, the work should be played as a whole and has mm -hmm. a specific length, which simply varies according to whether it's performed fast or slow. Yes, but if we wouldn't, wouldn't the audience actually hear your piece in the same way it hears the Bach piece? With no, with why can't people, they have, it, they have two ears, they should be able to listen in at least two different ways. Uh, and with all the powers of the human mind, it seems to me that nowadays we should be able to listen appropriate to what we are hear appropriately to what we are hearing. Let us say, hear a work which is made as an object, as an object hear a work which is made as process, as process. I understand now. Yes. And where criteria are useful, use them. And where they are pointless, uh, let them go for a while. Well, I don't this is... Okay. Do you, would you agree with, um, with the statement that in your compositions, time goes by while nothing happens, happens? This has been suggested. Uh, it seems reasonable, yes. Time does go by, and if nothing's happening, then uh, whatever is happening in the environment does happen. Okay. Uh, I'd like to make one final last-ditch attempt to muster my, my traditional resources <laughs> as objects, uh, in favor of object. although I, th I think I understand your position, but I wonder, although I agree that a single note makes one aware of eternal silence, let's put it that way, Shouldn't we demand more of music than even knowing this truth? In other words, you might call this defeatist, but let's, uh, let me go into it a little more. Can't one accept a Zen view of existence, let's say, and, and still question the relevance of this view to the artistic experience? For art is not nature, and it, I, mean, I think this, is, this would be my view. Art is not nature, nature, but rather it is essentially a human activity, and art's imposed constructions are necessary for this activity. The question then arises, is, is this necessary? Is this what we truly need? And as Nietzsche put it, said, um, to <laughs> quote preeminent authority, Nietzsche said it in this, the following in Birth of Tragedy, and I quote, with this chorus, talking about the Greek chorus and Greek tragedy, with this chorus, the profound Greek, so uniquely susceptible to the subtlest and deepest suffering, who had penetrated the destructive agencies of both nature and history, solaced himself, 
Though he had been in danger of craving a Buddhistic denial of the will, he was saved by art, and through art life reclaimed him. In this supreme jeopardy of the will, art, that sorceress expert in healing, approaches him. Only she can turn his fits of nausea into imaginations with which it is possible to live. These are, on the one hand, the spirit of the sublime, which subjugates terror by means of art, and on the other hand, the comic spirit, which releases us through art from the te tedium of absurdity. Mm. This would be my... <laughs> I, I would agree with that. I, um, I would say this is an extreme position of a sort, but in complete contradistinction almost to what, what you're saying. Do you, mm. do you see any, any relevance, any value in this way of living, in this way of accepting art? Well, I enjoy this statement of Nietzsche's but um, I'm not absolutely certain that my that the view that I hold is opposed to it. But I would see art not as opposed to nature, but certainly as a means of introducing us to nature, of which we are part. Art certainly is essentially a human activity, but it can move from being a selfish human activity to being what I would call a human activity which is fluent with nature. Now, I don't see this view of mine as being opposed to the spirit of the sublime, nor certainly do I see it as opposed to the comic spirit. But the idea um, that man is saved by art is an idea of... I'm not so much interested in um, salvation yes, that, as I am yeah. in enlightenment. These are the great differences between the um, Far East and um, Greek thought. I want to wake up to the very life I'm living not to be saved at some future time. <laughs> okay. Well, let's see. I, th I think we'll come right back. I'd like to. I'd like the audience to hear a little more. Have sort of an intermission, so to speak. Um, a little more. We'll take up the Fontana mix from where we left off at the beginning, and we'll be back as soon as this, as soon as the piece is finished. <laughs> folkloristica al... Oh. 
Solo to talk to shock, si la noche la verita. Il 
just heard John Cage's Fontana mix with Aria, and I believe Kathy Bavarian was soprano soloist. Well, Mr. Cage, let's see, uh, about this, you know, they might as well start off from, just, way, uh, excuse me. Contralto, she is. Contralto. That, that's a, oh. a mezzo. Right. And it's Aria with Fontana mix. Didn't I say that? No, you said Fontana mix with Aria. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're not reversible, huh? You, that. Well, uh, ladies first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, about this piece, I might as well start off from this, you know, um, I mean, I'm, I'm very much struck by it. You can't keep a straight face to this piece. I mean, I've heard it a number of times, and it always strikes me as being... It's it's moving in a way, and it's also very, very funny. Mm -hmm. Not in the witty sense, but very funny, very comic in a sense. Is this, would you say this comedy is one of laughing at the audience, or is it rather a, a way of looking at things rather than a, a laughing at a person? Or uh, I think it comes through the uh, multiplicity of, of sounds on the tapes of the Fontana mix, and also the... Um, plurality of languages and styles of singing that um, the singer employs. And this juxtaposition of things not ordinarily juxtaposed produces in many people the feeling of mirth. You're not trying to laugh at them, though, as often been claimed. I, no, no, I have never felt it within my uh, responsibility as a composer to laugh at people. They often take it as this, though. Uh, is this their own, 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 own discomfort, would you say, or is it... Uh... It must be, because I, the idea never entered my mind. Okay. Well, to change the subject for a minute, I'm very much interested uh, in, in uh, this book, Silence, which I mentioned before, published by Wesleyan University Press, and it contains lectures and stories and essays and so on. Now, I think that the book could stand, especially with regard to the stories, as a very unusual and often very, um, well, telling work of literature. And how did you get started with these stories and also those lectures that look on the surface like Mallarmé's uh, Throw of the Dice, uh, typographically speaking? Since the 30s, I have been asked to give talks about music, and uh, ordinarily... Rather than giving informative talks, I've tried to give ones which would um, exemplify what I was doing in the field of um, musical composition at that time. And so I've been led to make uh, other than conventional uh, texts. W did you refer to one just now, one in particular? One particular lecture? Mm -hmm. No, I said that... Um a uh, number of the lectures look on the surface typographically like Malamé's mm -hmm. coup de day, you know, the throw of the dice yes. poem in which the well, chance the, element... Yes, well, the, uh, empty, the empty parts of the page simply yeah. refer to um, uh, silence, and I have both in, in those texts and in my musical compositions equated space with um, time, so that when I come to an empty space, it represents an empty time. I see. Uh, do you have any uh, literary plans of this sort for the future? Uh, not so much in terms of uh, of the lectures, which I'd be interested in, but also in terms of uh, some of those stories, which really people don't know very well, and which seem so simple in a way and so naive, yet there's something that, that happens after they're read. Well, from time to time, I, I continue writing those stories. In the book, there are about um, 90, and altogether I've written um, around 180, perhaps 200. Now and then I write another one. Do you consider yourself a writer of any particular sort? Because it seems to me that, uh, I mean, they're, they're so closely inter intertwined, all these ideas you've been talking about, and the, and the way they appear in print, and the way they sound, mm -hmm. so to speak. Well, I've written a book, so I must be a writer. <laughs> and they've asked for a second one. I just do what I do. I don't so much consider myself a, a writer now and then I write. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know really what else... Um, 
there were some other things I want to ask you. Yes, yeah, someone wanted to, I won't reveal the name, but they wanted to ask me, a ask you a question, and it seems rather cute, but um, the question was, does time fly? I wondered if you'd <laughs> want to answer that. Well, I, I think it's a half-serious question, in fact. Yes. The question of time is one which interests me um, uh, more and more. When we measure it, time is a kind of um, constraint. This business that we so often do, not only in our music but in our lives, that is to say, uh, enslave ourselves to getting to particular points in space at particular points in time is one which I am working now to free myself from. For the last ten years, my compositions are performed with the aid of stopwatches, and the whole business of performing them has been more or less like uh, catching trains. Uh, the last two compositions one which I wrote in this last fall in Japan is called um, Zero Minutes, Zero Seconds. It's written in such a way that it could also be read zero feet, zero inches. And that follows from my feeling of our present living, not in space and time, but in space-time. The uh, other one is uh, Variations 3. In both of those pieces, no stopwatch is used. Now, when we don't measure time, does it fly, as you say, or does it stand still? I don't really know the answer to this question, but that is what is engaging my deepest interest uh, this year, and perhaps for years to come. I did notice in Berlin just recently that uh, after performing for an hour and a half without a stopwatch, I was stopped and I had the feeling that only half an hour had passed. Well, tell me, um, in, in Sound of the Fury, for instance, just to uh, use a literary example, Faulkner describes one of the characters, Quentin, as uh, removing the uh, two hands of his watch and hearing, and uh, hearing, uh, having time become completely real at that moment, uh, his uh, Falcon's idea that time uh, becomes deadened by clocks and that it becomes alive once you remove those hands. Yes. Oh, I agree now very much. Yes. Uh, is it all possible about the, from the question, does time fly, that perhaps time does nothing? I mean that it. Why should time do anything? I, I see it now as um, as a grid of organization laid over our experience, which can be um, beneficially uh, removed. I see. I, I've noticed before that things... By beneficial, I refer back to that purpose of music that I gave earlier yes, uh, I this remember. evening. That is to say, the mind becomes more sober once we remove the clock, and we become more susceptible to divine influences once we remove the clock. Do you think uh, people will be able to stand that? My view is that I must myself test my experience myself. If I survive my experience and then am able to make it available to another person, if I have survived, I can deduce that he might survive. See, I, see I've always been struck by the fact, it, seemed, it always seemed to me that um, People are so consciously aware of time all the time that they have constructed this fantastic um, mm. artificiality, and that just by this tremendous construction, their attempt to get out of it, to escape yes. from it, that they are more, so much more caught up in it themselves. The great usefulness of time, of course, is in connection with practical social arrangements. That is, say, we agreed to meet here at a particular time, and had one of us been late, it would have been um, inconsiderate of the other. Those practical considerations are somewhat different than the considerations of art and, let us say, also of nature. And when through art and through nature we move into a different awareness of time than that practical one, 
then I don't think it makes any difference to us whether we say it flies or it stands still. And it's that time that uh, once we have experienced it, draws it back to it whenever we have the opportunity. Yes, do you, th you think that this might uh, solve that problem that was always being raised by Renaissance poets that um, gather you rosebuds while you may and Corinna, it's time to go maying. The, the sense of the loss of time can always be approached. I mean, one is always losing something. I mean, time has something to, of loss. Of yes, uh, not only loss, but we gain it sometimes. The interesting thing is to use it. Hmm? 